Hello, good day, and welcome to the first video in this series called Go Fiber. So, Go Fiber is a web application framework for building web application using the Go programming language. And I want to be clear that oh, there are many web frameworks out there, and you are encouraged to check them out just so you can see which one works for you. So, let's jump in. So today, we're going to talk very quickly about the problems that a web framework like Go Fiber tries to solve. Pretty much all the web frameworks for Go are trying to solve essentially the same problem. And then we talk a little bit about desired solution. Now, we're not going to go into a whole lot on the problem side or even a whole lot on the desired solution side because it's just you can go down a rabbit hole with that. So what is the problem? Well, the Go standard package called HTTP is very nice and capable. It is not very difficult to use, and you can get a lot done with it. As a matter of fact, all the Go web frameworks essentially builds on top of this. However, it's sort of kind of generic. It's almost as if someone give you Play-Doh and say, build something with it. Sure, you can form it into just about anything, but that is the problem. It is just too, you know, like without form, it's just too generic. It would be much nicer if somebody gave you something like Lego blocks, which already have some shape and some size and so on, and you can sort of use those. And so while the Go HTTP package is very capable, because it's so generic, it doesn't handle many edge cases. It doesn't do things like complex um, pattern matching. And then what that means is because it's so generic, you end up writing a lot of repetitive code. So if you write a web application using the HTTP package, you end up realizing that, you know what, I've sort of done this before. And so a lot of code just seems to repeat. Then there are certain things that you need when you build a web application. You need middleware. These are login middleware, tracing, um, things to do in security and other things. And it doesn't have any of those things built in. And again, not very difficult to write, but it just means that you have to keep rewriting them or at a minimum, um, keep reusing the ones you've written. And so at that point, you, it's going to look like you're building a web framework anyway. So you might as well just use one. There are many other things that we can say that is a problem, but we're not going to go down that road. So let's look at some of the things that we would desire. For example, we want something that's easy and expressive. So even though Go HTTP package is pretty easy to use, it would be nice to be able to make it clear and easy to see which HTTP method we're handling when we create a handler. Um, we want to handle complex routing. And by that, what I mean is your route might need to support parameters. And these are parameters that can change, right? These are the things like get a book or get an item with this ID, where item itself is fixed, but the ID can be dynamic. And so you want to be able to handle something like that. And so maybe we want to be able to handle middlewares. And ideally, if the framework could come with some middlewares that we don't have to write, then we can easily get our application built by just reusing what's already there. Um, and if there's something that we want to do that's not provided, it should be fairly easy and straightforward for us to write a middleware. So those are going to be sort of the things that we would like to see in our solution framework. Now, like I said, we could keep going in terms of what we need, but you know, there's no point. I just wanted to at least show you some of the things that are a problem and then some of the solution that we'd like to have. So let's jump in and go look at Go Fiber's website to see what it says. And so we can see from the Go Fiber website that it says that this is an express inspired web framework written in Go. So for those of you who know about Node, um, you might also be aware that there's a node package called Express that allows you to write web application using Node and JavaScript, essentially. And it's very simple, it's very popular, and a lot of features and so on. And so if you know Node and Express web framework, then Go Fiber is going to look very similar. And no surprise, it's inspired by Express. So let's jump to our command line, write a simple example, and compare that example with the HTTP standard package versus writing something similar with Go Fiber to see the difference. So here I am on my command line, and it's in my Go Fiber directory, and this is episode one, because this is our very first video um, on, in this section. 
and I'm going to start my VS Code editor. Now I have some code written already. It's not a whole lot. It's just again help get us started quickly. In this example code, we have a function defined on line 10 to 12, and the function is called items handler. What does it do? Well, it accepts two parameters: a HTTP response writer and an HTTP request. And the function just simply logs a message that says receive request for items. That's all. And then if we jump into main, we'll see that our online 15, we use the HTTP package and we say handle func and we say the path or the request path is items slash items. And when that is called, I want you to then invoke this handler for that path. So pretty straightforward. Then we um, log a message on line 17 saying that we're starting up this server on port 3000. That is just because if we start the server, we're not going to see anything, any output until a request comes in. So it's good to sort of like log the port you're starting on. And then we say HTTP listen and serve, and we tell it to listen on all um, interfaces on port 3000. And then we check for error. If we don't have an error, this function is going to block on line 18. And that's it. We don't see anything else until we call the um, our handler. That's the only way we will see something live. So very simple. Um, API server. Now, if you want to learn more about how to write API server with the HTTP package, I have a set of videos on that and I'll link that here. So that might help you to understand some of the basic using the HTTP package and therefore you can be able to compare it when you come to using something like GoFiber. You don't need to understand how to use the HTTP package to use GoFiber, but having that knowledge is going to help you better help you comprehend the, the differences between the two. So um, it's something that I would say is worth at least knowing. So let's go run our application and play with it a little bit. So if we go to our command line and we run our code, now we're in the episode 01 directory. So we're actually outside our example one directory. So we'll just run our code from here by saying example 01 main. It's not that complicated, it's just one file. And you can see there's a log message saying we're started our server on port 3000. And I'm going to use HTTP IE um, to make a GET request to our endpoint. Now, if you want to use HTTP IE, it's just brew install HTTP IE if you're on a Mac. Otherwise, you should look up what HTTP IE is and how to install it on your appropriate operating system. Otherwise, just use curl. And so, as you can see, um, I get back um, OK and I'm getting the log message on the screen. Now, my server doesn't actually return anything, so that's why I'm just getting OK. And I'm going to try different methods. So I try get, and notice if you don't put anything, it's automatically get. I try put, try a post, and try a delete HTTP method. Now, from the logs, you can't tell that I use different HTTP methods. They all look the same. And that's because this handler is simply invoked for any HTTP method so long as the path matches. And we'll see just now when we use GoFiber, we can actually say that no, I want this endpoint to only be called if the HTTP method matches something that I'm, uh, what I'm interested in. So if we want to see the method as being used to call our endpoint, we will have to retrieve it from the request and then now we can add it to the log message. All right, so once we do this, and we stop and restart our application. Now, when we make those requests, we'll see that how it shows us the method that was actually used to submit that request. So here we're going to try delete, and you can see there we have the delete method. Method was used. We'll then try post, put, and then of course get. Okay, so that works. So once again, just showing that how. We can call different methods, but they all go to the same endpoint. So what if we wanted to do something different for each one of these HTTP methods? So each one of these methods implies some sort of operation. So a put, for example, is generally used to modify a resource. A post is generally used to create resource. And get is usually used to retrieve resource. And delete, of course, is to delete that resource. So if we're using the HTTP basic package, the only way we can do something different is that we'll have to switch or do conditional handling for each one of the methods based on what was submitted, right? So then we'll have to like check either using an if statement or in this case, 
use a switch statement to switch on the different methods. And that's because let's say we want to handle all four. Now, if we were just interested in one, we just check and see, is it the method we're interested in and it, uh, do something, otherwise ignore it or say that it's not supported, right? But notice the code that we have to write here to say that, hey, if it's a get, do something. Now, if you imagine that how we actually wanted to get some data or create a resource or something, we'd have to then turn around and call other functions to do this work. So not quite as clean. Again, not terrible, but not quite as clean. And then for any other methods, and there are other methods, um, we would say that, oh, it's not supported. All right, so this would work fine at this point if we wanted to do something different. So, so let's see what this looks like when we use Fiverr. So we'll copy our example one, and of course we name it to example two. Um, let me close the file here. And because I don't want to keep rerunning my application, I'm gonna use task. So here's my task file, and I explained it before, so I'm not gonna go through explaining it. And so if you want, you can copy this one or just write your own. But here's my task file, and I'm just going to go into my example two directory and run task minus w watch, and then I want dev. This is the task that I have on line four. And so this is going to then run my go compile my Go application and run it. And then if it see the Go file change, it's going to just do the same thing again. All right, so now let's code. So while that is running and task is watching my file for changes, now I don't have to worry about restarting my application or rerunning my application or anything like that. Now I could just focus on coding. So the very first thing I want to do is create a an application. Fiverr has this thing called application um, type and it implements routing and so on. So I want to create a new Fiverr application. And so that's simple, simply a matter of calling Fiverr is new and ensuring that we're using Fiverr, Go Fiverr version two. Now on the application, I can configure my routes. So the first route here is going to be a get method on the endpoint slash items. Notice I'm specifically saying that I want the slash items endpoint to support just the get method. I also want to support post on the same endpoint. But notice, because there are two different line of code, I can put different handlers for them. I no longer have to worry about you know, doing a switch statement or anything like that. Additionally, I can say I want a dynamic or um, a dynamic endpoint or one with a parameter. And in this case, I want ID to be this dynamic value. So items will be fixed, but colon ID says, so that part can change. So let me give my handlers a slightly better name than, you know, adding handlers to each one. So the first one there is going to be get all items. Then when I want a specific item, I'll specify it by using the endpoint with the ID. And then if I post to items, that means I want to create an item. So I'm happy with these handlers now. Now that I have my endpoint set up, I have to then start my application will start listening. So for that, I'll say app that listen, and then I'll say I want to listen on port um, 3000. And just with the HTTP listen and serve, there's an error message that's, that's error. There's an error that's returned, and I could check that error to see if there was an issue starting my application. All right. Now let's move on to writing our handlers. So we'll repurpose this first handler here to be our get all items endpoint. And so it's pretty simple. If we say get all items, it means return all the items that we have. And so we could change the name of this function. And we don't actually have a set of items now. Now, our handler needs to have a very specific signature. And for GoFiber, that is, it takes the a pointer to fiber.ctx, which is fiber context, and it returns an error message. Don't worry about exactly what the fiber context is, just note how it gives you a number of useful methods for dealing with um, the data that you're gonna receive, either from a post or a request and so on, or in your responses, and we'll see that in a bit. We want to return a set of item as JSON. And so in this example, you'll see that the fiber context has a method called JSON, and that allows us to return JSON value to the client. And so we can see here that we want to return some items. So what are our items? Well, we haven't defined it yet, but we'll just do a slice of items. 
and so for that we'll define item as a struct with three fields you know an id a title and a price i'm just making stuff up and then we'll define a few items and put them in this slice no problem is um, my item as i define them uses id int so i need to go back and change in the struct the type from id string to id int and so i'm okay with that and then now um, my application is happy with my get all items handler so let's write the next handler which is to get a specific item in this case remember the endpoint add a parameter called colon id so the way you access that value in your handler is to say c which is the fiber context that parse and then you can say c that params and then you can pass in the id or the name of that parameter now if you know that id is an int you can just say params int otherwise params just returns a string in this case the params int is actually going to try and parse that id or that value from the request as an int and then if it's successful it'll return it otherwise it'll give you an error message so we can check and see if it was successful if it wasn't successful we know at all that url had maybe a string after the second slash and therefore it couldn't be parsed as an id otherwise we know that we have an id and so we just loop through the list of items we do have and see if the requested id is in that list if we find that then we simply return it as a json notice how on line 37 that's pretty easy we say return see that json which means if we can successfully return it or it's our message is going to be null back to fiber letting it know everything is okay and otherwise we can then return a message saying not found but also notice our http status we can say return see that status and we can return the http status that says status not found again these are things we're going to talk about later but just know so we can set different statuses um, so finally the last one is to create an item and notice the signature again same for all our handlers and this time we want to define an item which we do on line 46 but now we want to read that json document that's posted for this endpoint into the item and once again fiber context has a nice convenient method for us it's called body parser which says parse the body of this the request into this item and if we can do it once again we have a valid item um, from the json if not we say that all this is an invalid json and the only thing we need to do is make sure that we give an id a unique id to the new item that we're going to create and so we just keep incrementing our id that's all and other than that we add it append it to our list and that's it and notice once we have successfully done all of that if we do that correctly our task is going to rerun our code and we should see it running successfully and that's what we see here that we we um our application is up and we see some you know output from a nice output from go fiber telling us about the number of processes number of handlers that we have handlers that we have defined and so on we're, we're going to ignore some of that but notice um we don't even have to print out that we are running starting our web server on port 3000 because Go Fiber prints that out for us. So we can actually remove that log statement now. We don't need it. Okay, so let's go to test our endpoint. So if we do a get on items, you can see those are the three items we have there as a JSON document, which is essentially our array. And then we can request a specific item. So we could request one, we could request item two, we could request item three. Notice when we request item four, we get not found, and our HTTP status code is indeed not found as opposed to okay. And that is error code 404. And then we get the text message item also saying not item not found. Now we can try doing a post. And so we're going to use HTTP and we're going to make it very easy to post a JSON document. We essentially just need to write out the fields and HTTP composes a JSON document for us. Now, because I want the value for price to be read as not a string, but rather a integer or a float i put colon equal and so when i send it you can see there it is it's um has that and sends it um sends it as a document and it was created successfully so we can see our post was successful and we can do get and retrieve it now it didn't send 
a float value that actually sends it as an integer. If you don't have HTTP and you want to test this with curl, notice if I do curl localhost colon 3000 item, sorry, for slash item, I get back the same result. And I could pipe that to jQuery to format it nicely for me because curl doesn't print it out nicely formatted like um, HTTP. I can still request individual ones, but I can also tell HTTP to sort of do it quietly. Well, uh, I think the argument here is not minus Q, but rather minus S. So let's try that. Um, and so yeah, it's minus S and notice how it silenced some of that, um, you know, the status message, the progress messages. Now we can do the same thing and with, we can also use curl to post a message um, to our endpoint. We just have to use the minus minus, the minus D or minus minus data argument to curl to specify a JSON document. Note, however, in that case, we have to actually specify the JSON document. So it takes a little bit more like finessing on the command line because you have to make sure at all you enclose in, you know, everything in single quotes because you're going to be using double quotes and so on. So that's the um, one issue. You can also specify the method you're going to use as with minus X to say that I'm doing a post. Um, however, curl can also infer that when you do minus D option, it automatically switches to a post. Okay, so that's it for this video. I just wanted to make a quick introduction to Go Fiber just to show you just the benefit that you get immediately from using something like this as opposed to trying to do the same application using the standard package. Now, you could still do the same thing. It's just a little bit more code you'd have to write and a little bit more boilerplate. So I definitely think that oh, this alone makes it um, worthwhile to learn to use something like this. If you've reached this point and you have not subscribed yet, please, please hit the subscribe button, um, thumbs up the video, leave a comment. Let me know what you think, uh, what you'd like to see. I do read the comments even if I don't get to respond right away. So definitely, I definitely will reply to all the comments that um, you post, um, if, especially if you ask me a question. And once again, I'm asking you to share with your friends uh, my Tesla referral link. I would really, really appreciate it if you know anyone who is going to buy anything from Tesla, solar panel, whatever, it doesn't matter. If you would ask them to use my Tesla referral link or if you yourself are going to buy something, absolutely, definitely use it. So that's one way in which you can help support me and show me some love. Um, otherwise, there are other ways to support the channel, Patreon and all that sort of stuff. So um, feel free to um, take a look at those also. Until the next video, Take care, stay safe, bye.